introduction and I'm so excited to be talking about this and uh, thank you uh, Lily for inviting me. Uh, this lecture follows Lily's lecture from in November where she discussed among other things uh, the 15th century uh, travel and commercial uh, journeys made by the Chinese to, uh, to Africa to the Middle East, to Sumatra, Java, and the Dutch actually used those uh, posts that they uh, developed to, for their own travel. So, uh, as you can see, we're doing a little bit of looking at paintings and we see here some Dutch tiles. Next slide, please. Um, I'm beginning actually with a painting that you may be surprised I would start with because it has nothing to do with Chinese ceramics. Uh, it is a scene uh, that is very, very Dutch. Uh, there is a father, a mother, a grandma, and a whole bunch of kids in a messy household. And they're celebrating a unique, typically Dutch celebration, the 5th of December in Holland. And we still do today, uh, the past 5th of December, we did it, um, a celebration of St. Nicholas. And it's a, a kind of a combination of Thanksgiving, uh, the American Thanksgiving and the American uh, Christmas where you give presents and all the families get together. So you can see the little girl got presents, the little boy did not get what he wanted and he's being teased, it's, it's chaos. Now what does this have to do with China? China is present in all Dutch homes, I want to tell you. Next slide, please. Because this is where China is present. This is a middle-class family. They have enough to eat. They have a beautiful house. They have a big window. They have a bed. They have a beautiful, cl normal clothes. But it's a middle-class family. They're not wealthy. They're not nobility. They're not upper class yet. A silk skirt on a two-year-old. There is nowhere else in Europe where you would have where you would have a painting of a family, middle-class family, and you have a little girl with a silk skirt. How did this happen? Well, we will have to look at this and we will look have, to, have to look at that. Next slide, please. What happened is that um, <laughs> uh, Marco Polo in 1300 wrote a book about how incredibly wealthy China is. And that inspired Europeans and especially the Dutch. The Dutch had a terrible war with Spain. And Spain, of course, was already here uh, with Portugal. They were already trading with India and they were trading with China. Uh, and the Dutch were having a war. And so um, they wanted to get rid of Spain and they wanted to get rich, very rich. And so the quickest way to China was actually the quickest way to wealth and to get rid of the Spanish, that power that the Dutch wanted. And this, uh, I take these quotes from Timothy Brook, um, who wrote a book called uh, Vermeer's Hat. Some of you may know that. And uh, he states the, that the quest to get to China was a relentless force that did much to shape the history of the 17th century. And that is absolutely true for Holland. And I will tell you, I will show you how this is true by talking about porcelain. So the Dutch East Indies, the United East India Company, started in 1602 during this terrible war with Spain. They united a bunch of cities and they were going to get the monopoly of all the silk, all the spices in Asia. And they did so by force. So it's called Kaap Fart. Kaap is catch, Fart is go. So you, you do it by catching, piracy, banditry, Plunder, slavery, the, the Dutch were the biggest slave traders in the 17th century, and then trade. Um, actually, the VOC, as you probably can notice from the way I'm talking, the Dutch are not very uh, contemporary Dutch people, just don't like to talk about the VOC because it was really a horrible way of dealing with people and dealing with becoming rich. So as you can see, See, your speaker is not. Please check your connection or use different speaker. Never happened to you. Can you all hear me? Am I okay? Between I, 16, I okay. Between 1602 and 1607, 
the Dutch VOC sent warships. They didn't send ships to trade, they sent warships. So they sent warships to Asia that could also hold a lot of the plunder that they picked up. Next slide, please. Now, the, what they got was silk. During the 17th century, the Dutch United East India Company, the VOC, imported, this is beyond belief, 72,000 pounds of silk from China per year, per year. This is for a country that has a million people. So you, this is an amazing amount of, of silk. So Amsterdam became the silk capital of the world. Everybody that wanted silk would come to Amsterdam. They wouldn't go to China, they would go to Amsterdam. Spices, the VOC controlled the trade in spices, nutmeg, clove, cinnamon. One million pounds of cinnamon was imported each year. Now, where do we see all of this? We see the silk here and we see the spices in these uh, uh, treats that are still at the moment, uh, uh, today, also baked around this very time. So what you have here is sugar from the West Indies, flour from the, ba from the Baltic states, and spices and pepper, if there's any pepper in there, from Asia. So this is the foundation of the wealth of this family. This is the foundation that trade with the Baltic, especially, that was the biggest trade. But then the trade with Asia and the trade with West Indies is the foundation of all those beautiful homes that you may have seen in Amsterdam along all those various canals. That is the foundation. Next slide, please. Now, the problem is that porcelain was only 2% of this whole big uh, enterprise, 2%. And another problem, there is nothing written about porcelain. All the Dutch were literate, they wrote, they were the first to translate Confucius, they wrote the first play that was set completely in China. They, they, there's no reason that they didn't write about it, but they didn't. So all we have now are some uh, lists of um, manifests of, of what the cargo brought to Amsterdam, or we have what we uh, we have shipwrecks where you can see the porcelain that came up <laughs> that was in a ship that was uh, destroyed, or we have cesspits in Delft, in Amsterdam, in all these big cities where you can see what people had, and we have paintings. So I begin with a few sta uh, statistics that are that are taken from some of the letters that people wrote at the time. First of all, 602, it starts with the capture of a Caraca, that is a cargo ship, Caraca cargo, Santiago, and the next year, uh, a ship Santa Catarina, they were both Portuguese ships loaded with uh, stuff from China, and the Dutch captured those. That's how they did it. They were pirates. So according to the admiral of the boat, of the ship, of the, the Santa Catarina, the Catarina contained an aston astounding amount of fine and coarse porcelain. Now, we don't really know how much, but this is what people guess, that that had 60,000 kilograms of porcelain 100,000 pieces, and that of course had to be sold, so it had an auction in Amsterdam. Everybody in Amsterdam could see it, and from all over Europe, dignitary, dignitaries came to buy the porcelain, says Hugo de Groot, a cousin of him at the same time. It's also very famous. Now, another term that we will use for this porcelain is kraak. And I will explain what that means. And Wan Li. Wan Li was the emperor at that time. And so that is the porcelain that's named after him. Next slide, please. So imagine this. And this is another guess that people have. 602 to 650, the first 50 years. Three million pieces of porcelain brought to the Dutch Republic, where they only have one million people. So this is just an amazing amount of porcelain. And you have to imagine, you can imagine why the Dutch was, were totally obsessed with the Jindus and porcelain, which is the city in, for, in China where this was made, because this is what they had to, on the right-hand side. You can see the brown um, 
uh, clay, it's just a simple uh, color. Imagine that that's what you're used to. And suddenly you see this uh, on the left, you see this amazingly beautiful plate, blue, white, translucent. It's so thin. It's so hard. And people have no idea how it's made. That is what, what also is attractive. It, it is this mystery. And there are all these stories about it. maybe it breaks when you put poison in it or <laughs> all kinds of, of, of guesses that people have. Next slide, please. Well, we don't know how People used it because people didn't write anything about it. So we go, luckily for us, we go to paintings. And there is this one painting that's used all the time because here you have a very proper 17th century family. They're all in black, which is very proper, very expensive to be in black. Uh, they have a beautiful white tablecloth. They all have bread. In the middle, there's a piece of meat of some kind. But if you really look at the heart of the painting, there is a what's called a salt cellar. And those are very expensive. Salt was absolutely rare. So this family has stuff on the table that they're very proud of. But at the place where you would have the golden mean, I hope you can see it. That's uh, right in kind of to the left in the center of the table is a little cup. And that cup looks totally out of place. Next slide, please. It is a cup that is completely different from the tin plates, from the other kinds of uh, 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 furniture that people have. It is actually bright blue. The picture doesn't show it as bright blue because the blue was not, the paint that the artist used was not the expensive paint. And it is a fugitive color, a color that disappears. So, <laughs> but can you imagine what that must have looked like at the table? Bright red cherries or strawberries or whatever in this unique Cup. Now remember, this cup comes from China, and so it is a, 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 an absolute rarity. 1614, somebody comes to Holland and say, says, imagine, porcelain is used only, is only known in, in the possession of kings and queens outside of Holland, but in Holland, they have a nearly daily use Porcelain is, is, is in nearly daily use with common people. So here you have one of those commoners who has porcelain on the table. But that's not, not all. Continue, please. Here you have an absolutely unique situation as you compare it with other countries around. In 1630, this is really the high point of the import of porcelain. This family... We don't know who they are. They're not famous. They're, you know, they're well to do, but they're middle class. They have a nice house. They have visitors. They're all dressed in black, proper Calvinists, and they have a beautiful table. But what do they have on the wall? They have over 30 plates and cups taken from China. This is new. This, this is a new way of displaying porcelain in ordinary household. These are, and this is actually for the first time, this is the effect of global trade, that you have luxury items, exotic and decorative, and that is accessible to common people. Only kings and queens have extra stuff. In the beginning of the century, nobody had a cupboard in Holland. At the end of the century, everybody has a cupboard because they all get extra stuff. And so you can see this extra stuff. Next slide, please. What did they have on those? ledges. This is what they would have had on the ledges. This is what would have enthralled them. On the left side, you see a dish. In the center, you see birds. Uh, around the uh, um, rim, you see panels. Uh, the panels are divided in narrow and broad uh, strokes. And all of that has symbols in it that are Taoist symbols that are totally <laughs> unknown to the Dutch. They would have just thought they were very exotic and exotic and, and interesting and new and strange. And on the right hand side, you see what is a called a crow cup, but that's not inside this little bird, but it's not a crow. A crow, that is what the English called it, but the crows are sad, a symbol of sadness in China. So it would have been 
probably a magpie which sings early in the morning and wishes you a good morning. So it has a bird in the center and then it also has these panels and it is absolutely stunning in its beauty, its elegance, its mystery. Next slide, please. So the definition of Wanli or Kraak porcelain, that is Kraak is the Dutch use of Karaka, that is the, the kind of porcelain that came in uh, in Amsterdam in, two, in 1603 and that everybody looked at and everybody startled by, that was made in the period of Wanli. And so that is now called Kraak porcelain. The, the term was coined in the 17th century, a little later. It's export ware that was designed and made for Europeans, also for, it was also used in Persia, but this is really made for Europeans. It's not made for Chinese. Uh, and you can see the divided uh, panels in alternating wide and narrow panels filled with auspicious symbols and flowers. It has, at you, if you look carefully, the edge, the rims are very, very, uh, crisp and they are burst open a little bit during firing. So that made it even more interesting. That was just, just a puzzle. And you see the little bird in the cup on the right. Next slide, please. Well, we have to look at paintings to see what kind of porcelain they had because porcelain breaks. And uh, even though many of these dishes were not really used, they still, there's they're still very rare. So we really rely on paintings. And this is a fantastic painting that we had in the San Diego Museum of, Museum of Art when we had the exhibition of the Grasset Collection. And this is by an artist, Van Dijk, who painted a number of these still lives. And you can see the glorious bowls. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's truly amazing. And they're painted with such precision. In the middle, you have the local cheese, and then you have the combination of these local cheeses of which they are so proud and they use them as export. Then you have the imports from China and you have the imports, uh, the, the, the grapes imported. You have the bright red tablecloth that is um, uh, with a red color from, um, from Latin America. Uh, this really is a, is a show off of Dutch trade of Dutch commerce, of the, the glory of the global trade of Holland. Next slide, please. Well, I live in The Hague now, and this Maurits house on the bottom, you can see the Museum Maurits house is about five minutes from my house. So I, uh, preparing for this lecture, I went over to the museum about two months ago and checked out which paintings had blue and white. And this is one of their treasures because it's made by Clara Peters, a woman. Um, and there are very few women. She's one of the fine, fine painters. And you see again, the cheese combined with the blue and white. It is truly amazing. Next slide, please. And here is another one in Maurits house. And I love this painting. Look at the fly, look at the grasshopper on the left, look at the, um, all of these grapes and look at the shells. People thought maybe porcelain was made of shells. So many times you see a painting with shells next to it. Uh, and it is again, painted with such precision that we can see the patterns of the kind of porcelain that was imported. But next slide. This painting, painted in 1674, was painted after there were no more of those uh, bowls coming in. And this is really when they became antiques and when they became extremely rare and extremely expensive. This painting was painted in honor of the gentleman that you see here with his very sour face. It is Willem III of Orange. He is the grandson of Henrietta Maria. We have a painting in the uh, San Diego Museum of Art of Henrietta Maria, his grandson and she was the Queen of England, and he is their, her grandson, and he was the Stadthouder. The Stadthouder is the person who takes a place in a country that's occupied. So he used to be the replacement, or his grandfather was the replacement, was the, 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 the representative of the King of Spain in Holland, Willem of Orange, and Willem of Orange turned against Spain and joined the rebels, and therefore he then, his family then became kind of a de facto um, nobility in the Netherlands and held the country together 
but the real rulers were the merchants and the traders. So he became in six, 1674, he became Stadthouder. And um, in honor of that event, a painting is made. Look at what symbolizes him. That is that orange apple. Of course, his last name and the family name is orange. So you think in English, that's, you yeah, know, put an orange there. But you know what an orange is? called in Dutch, which his, his, would have been his language, it's called a China apple. We still call it the Sinas, Sina, Sina, China, Sinas apple. So he, this is the China apple that represents the power of that he would like to be. Because of course, he's not a king like the king of Spain or the king of England or whatever, but he still wants to be seen in Europe like that. So he uses an Asian plate on the bottom to represent himself, his power. So you can see that China, not Asia, China is, symbolizes to the nobility in the Netherlands who tried to be internationally recognized. They did so by the importation of, or by the emphasis on all the imports from China. And so you see this fantastic blue and white plate with the Sinus apple, with the China apple on top of it. And then of course a shell next to it because that was considered maybe the source of the China plate. Next slide, please. So here you can see a detail. You can see what amazing uh, the, the way this, uh, this, this sinus apple has been painted and the peeling. But what is so fantastic is look at the reflection and that sinus apple continues to reflect forever and ever because you can see it above there twice. And if you look, it probably continues forever. So that is then the point that this painting is trying to make through the use of Chinese objects, that the, the reign of this Stadthouder, this nobility, will last forever because you also see the little flower to the left. The China, the China's apple, the Sinus apple, is the only fruit that has blossoms and fruits at the same time. So it'll go on forever. So you can see how important China was for this family, and I'll talk more about it later. Please continue. Van Vermeer used his, in his, some of his paintings in passing. You can see a plate. Next one, please. Uh, we've now talked, we have shown them on the table. We've shown them on the wall. We've looked at how important they are for still life painters. And we have seen how the nobility uses the porcelain imported from China. But what does it do to the Dutch potters? Next slide, please. Well, the Delft potters have to compete with China, but they're also inspired by China. On the left-hand side, you see an enlargement of one of those plates, and you can see the wonderful brushstroke with the light blue and the dark blue and all the flowers. It's just gorgeous. Then on the right-hand side, you see a Delftware uh, enlargement of a, of a, uh, of a <laughs> piece of ceramic. And you can also see how they imitate the brushstroke and how wonderful the flowers and the birds are and all of that. And then in the middle, you see something that's absolutely inspired thanks to Chinese porcelain, but it's completely different and now has been associated with the Netherlands. Please continue. Okay, so th this is what the mayor of Delft says, Delft and Holland's porcelain. So they called it, they didn't make porcelain, but they called it Holland's porcelain, the imitation, it's nep. <laughs> Nowhere in this country is porcelain made in a more subtle or refined manner. So it's not porcelain uh, as in this city in which they appear to imitate the Chinese most successfully. Next slide, please. So in, imagine that you are a potter in, porce, in uh, Delft and in 1672, 27, the VOC ship comes in with 9,440 pieces of porcelain, partially ca captured, you know, they were pirates, and partially bought. Then two years later, the ship comes back with over 5,000 pieces, a total of 50,000 of those beautiful pieces. How can you compete? Please continue. 
1644, they have terrible famines and they have droughts and they have civil war in China and the Ming dynasty is overthrown and no more porcelain comes in for 40 years. So in that period, the Delphair potters take over and they produce millions of pieces every year. 1665, there are by then 33 ceramic factories in Delft. In the beginning of the century, there are two. So you can see how Delft is competing with Chinese porcelain. Next slide, please. On the left, on the top of the left, you have an example of this wonderful Chinese porcelain. And the other ones, the other two are imitations. And you have a hard time looking and seeing that they, they are not Chinese porcelain. Even if you look, if you see them in real life in, in Dreyck's Museum in Amsterdam, uh, you can, I actually saw this plate. They have, a, <laughs> they have a wonderful exhibition of this. And then the other one is taken from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Next slide, please. So Kraak porcelain is then a source and inspiration for Delftware. And it, but these plates that I just showed you, would have been expensive, but they also make every, for everyday use. And here are five plates that will be used for every day. And on the right hand corner in the top, you can see how it's broken. Most of the pieces that were made by Delft for everyday use have, do not, have not survived because they were used for everyday use. And so they're mostly found in cesspits or in canals or um, they're broken, they're all in pieces. And the one on the left, on the right bottom is from the San Diego Museum of Art. And that also came from a cesspit. I don't know where the other ones came from, but you can see that they're all, you know, variations and they're imitations of Chinese porcelain, but they're not like the ones that I just showed you. This is everyday use. What did the upper class use? Next slide, please. This is now what inspired the Delft potters to do something totally novel. This is completely un-Chinese. You can call this, you know, uh, a Dutch version, a Dutch imitation, and, and it's really an innovation. The Dutch love flowers, and this one is probably inspired by the wife of the Stadthouder that I just showed you, Mary II. And Mary II was also a granddaughter of Henrietta Maria. They were full cousins, those two. Uh, he and she are both uh, descendants, in, grandchildren of the King and Queen of England. Uh, and Mary loved flowers and uh, had many, many flower vases made. And so this is one of the flower vases and each of these little openings would have had a, some flowers in it. On the right hand side is this incredible big wine cooler. And this is totally un-Chinese, but it is filled with Chinese um, images on it and it is made in Delft. Next one, please. At the end of the century, on the bottom of the right, you can see is a print. And that then became an inspiration for um, the illustrations on the expensive uh, vases and plates and so forth. In the, on the right, you can see that this is made, uh, this is part of a book on the history of China, made by a man named Dopper. It was translated in many languages, and this is very cliche, it is very full of stereotypes. He had never been in China. It's really a uh, uh, that is the kind of images that Europeans make about China for Europeans. Next slide, please. And you can see how close, how, how, how important those, those printed sources were for the illustrations on the vases. And this is one of the areas of, of uh, research at the moment. People are very interested in the Chinese books because Chinese books came to Holland and uh, to see if they can still find some and see if there were illustrations in those books copied on the vases. Next one, please. So here we have Mary on the right and, and on the left, her husband right next to it. And they are both uh, the upper nobility, the, the highest people in the Netherlands. And she is crazy about flowers. Her, uh, her mother-in-law 
was already a Dutch, uh, the Dutch woman, uh, Amelia. She was already a collector of Chinese porcelain. She had hundreds of, of, of pieces. And this is what Mary did with the huge number of Chinese porcelain that she collected. She was a great supporter of Delftware. She, she collected Delftware. He loved Delftware also. They gave Delftware to all their friends and, and other nobility in Europe. <laughs> and so this is how she, we do, there, there are no walls, there are no buildings left, but she had a room with 300 pieces of porcelain uh, in it. And she called that her Asian room or her Chinese room. Next one, please. And this is what Daniel Defoe said. The queen, that is this lady on the right, they both became king and queen of England then uh, through the glorious revolution. And they moved to England and they moved all their porcelain with them. And so Daniel Defoe has been inside the rooms and says, the queen brought in the custom or humor of furnishing houses with chinaware, which increased to a strange degree afterwards, piling their china upon the tops of cabinets and every chimney piece to the tops of the ceilings and even setting up shelves for the chinaware. This is an, 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 a replica that was made for an exhibition, um, Asia in Amsterdam. We don't really know what it looked like, but she had hundreds of pieces on all kinds of shelves. She used an, a French, interior designer to help her create uh, the decor. Next slide, please. So <laughs> then the pinnacle for us uh, in Dutch, uh, the Dutch uh, Rijksmuseum is so, calls this the pinnacle of their, their collection of Delftware. This is made um, in Delft and it is a, what is, what they call a flower pyramid. It's not a pyramid, it's more of an obelisk or, uh, uh, but they called pyramids, they didn't really care about the term. And if you look at all the different corners, there are little faces and each face has an opening and there are flowers put in there. So it's a flower pyramid and you have them in twos. She ordered them, she had them designed. Uh, she, there are a total of 40 that she ordered. There are at the moment only six left. Next slide, please. The previous one was the Rijksmuseum. This one is in The Hague. So Holland has four of the six. The other two are in the Victoria and Albert Museum because of course she moved, they moved to England. So they had them in England and those 40, they used as gifts to other English people. And many of their friends and, and colleagues <laughs> in the nobility would have an Asian room with Dutch porcelain, or they would call it the Dutch room because they had the porcelain in it. And I copied uh, their little image there. You can see how beautifully they were painted. Next slide, please. But it was really based on a print from a book. On the bottom, you can see it is a illustration of Johan Neuhoff. He actually is one of the very few Dutch people who actually went to China. The Holland, the, the Chinese never let a Dutch person into the country. Holland never had access to China. It always had to go through Sumatra or Java or some other place to get the, uh, the Chinese would come there with their porcelain. Uh, so this is one of the seven wonders of the world, the 15th century porcelain tower of Nanjing built out of white porcelain bricks and uh, red, green, red and yellow glazed relief bricks. So that was the inspiration. They looked at this book and that was what the inspiration was. Next, please. <laughs> and then they sent a copy of this to Jindazen to have it made out of actual porcelain. And this is the new thing then, the Chine de Commande. So this is even, it was even signed as if it was made in Delft, as if Delft now could make real porcelain. Next one, please. Uh, and the total pitch one <laughs> is uh, made uh, two years ago at the freeway, along the freeway in Delft, and celebration of this pinnacle of Delftware, this huge obelisk the, of the, with, for the flowers of Queen Mary II. Please continue. And the Rijksmuseum has 
uh, has them now in the cafeteria, in the restaurant, for example. I took this picture when I was in the restaurant and they have these dried flowers or they are probably artificial flowers. But here you can see what it would have looked like. Each of the corners, each of these segments is separate. So they have would hold water. And uh, then in each of the segments, you have four flowers. And um, they're very difficult to bake. And out of these segments have to fit. And if one segment breaks, the whole thing is useless. Uh, so anyway, these are nap, of course. These are contemporary. They were new. Uh, but there's uh, different places in the, in the Rijksmuseum. They, this, they have them because this is the pinnacle of Dutch Delftware. Next, please. Because we need to get to the, to the kitchen tiles. So here we have the innovation for the queen and we have the kitchen tiles. And if you look at the tiles, imagine you're a tile maker. Those are the kinds of tiles you make all the time. Next slide, please. But wouldn't you like to make some little tiles like that? Look at the children games. And that is this artist, uh, Peter de Hoog, is from Delft. So he puts out these Delft tiles in the wall. Next slide, please. And here is our wonderful painting for Vermeer that will never leave the Rijksmuseum there. This is one of their trophies. But when they discuss it, they never talk about the, the, the Delft tiles in the, in, the, in the background there because they are so ordinary. Um, one of the tiles that's closest to her skirt. Next tile, please. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Would you go back, please? Ah, uh, one of the tiles next to her skirt is a little uh, Cupid, and I found a Cupid in our own collection. All of the tiles I'm showing you are from the San Diego Museum of Art, which has a fantastic tile collection. Next one, please. So, Vermeer used these tiles in many of his paintings. The interesting thing is, he never used any bowls that were made, he never used Delftware bowls or cups or, or whatever in his paintings. He used some of the Chinese porcelain in his paintings, but he used many, many tiles. If you look at the painting on top left in the corner there, and this is a music room, there are tiles. Painting on the top right, here you have a scientist. This is the scholar. There are tiles in the back. In the left corner, there's another music room. There you can see the little tiles in the right corner hand on the bottom, the salon, the lady is writing, and there are tiles in the bottom. You really have to look to see the tiles, but obviously Vermeer was very, uh, I don't know if he was proud of it, but it is so common that he, and he's so precise in his replication of what these, his eyes saw that he play, paints these tiles. Next slide, please. So here we have China in the Netherlands. We have imitation. We have inspiration, and you can see that, and innovation. We go from Delftware for the queen on the right to the common kitchen tiles on the, in the middle. And this is a wonderful tile that we have. We have rare tiles in our museum. This one is absolutely rare. It's called, I have fallen and I can't get up. I think that is just a title that the curator probably gave it because this is a man trying to help a lady get up. <laughs> but you can also see some ships in the back and you see some little houses. You can see how much fun those uh, painters had. Uh, that painted their styles. And they were members of the St. Luke Guild, just like Vermeer was. Um, uh, in other words, many of these people that painted those styles may have been artists that were out of work or whatever, and the tiles are really stunning. Next slide, please. So here I have a few of the stunning slides from our visible, that you can actually see at the moment. On the left-hand side, very popular or tiles that uh, described uh, biblical scenes, and you can see how detailed that is. Um, many times fireplaces would have hundreds of these tiles. In the middle, you see these very these soldiers, and you'd have a variety of soldiers. And then we have this wonderful bird, many different birds we have in our collection, but these are on view. So you can go to the museum and look at the next slide, please. And then you can actually tell this very story. On the left side, you see the actual porcelain made for, for uh, export. This is an actual porcelain 
vase that would have come into Amsterdam that would have been bought there, would have been seen, would have been put on one of those ledges. On the right hand side is a plate that was found in a cesspit in Delft, Delftware, made for common use. And then in the middle, you have that completely new tile. And I love this tile because it is a fish with a face. Next slide, please. And so China and the Netherlands, we have global trade, and you can now see the effect of global trade with exotic porcelain coming in, and that lead us to common kitchen tiles, from imitation to innovation. And thank you. Next slide, please, which will be my last slide. And that is it. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you, Hulda, and I, I say this... Uh, uh, with enormous sincerity that you're a treasure and I, I can't get over how fortunate we are to have you this morning for this lecture or this evening where you are. But this is just absolutely wonderful. And I'm stimulated. I am uh, I work at the museum as a docent, but I'm stimulated to go back there and look at this. This is just absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And uh, we're going to have time for questions. But first, we're going to have... Uh, Nancy Wu uh, talked to us about British pottery, and then we're going to try to integrate uh, the British pottery experience with the uh, Dutch pottery experience, and then we're going to talk about it. So, uh, Nancy, why don't you uh, take it away? And uh, thank okay. you again for being here today, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, yes. Well, first I have to thank uh, Lily for inviting me, then thank everybody for coming. To follow Hilda's fantastic talk, I really have my work cut out for me. So please bear with me and I'm going to try to paint a sketch of English pottery, uh, including the father of English pottery to uh, present to you. Hope when you finish my talk and you walk away knowing a little bit more about the person of Wedgwood. I'm sure you all heard of a Wedgwood product, but I'm not sure how many of you really know the person. And he's, to me, he's a hero. Okay, my first slide touches very briefly. Uh, Mu Ting, please, first slide, yeah. Uh, English pottery goes back 5,000 years ago to the Neolithic time. And prior to 16th century, the products were just made of red clays, kind of crude, uh, with or without glaze. Uh, during that time, there's an imitation of uh, uh, Delft ware as well. Um, it's called English Delft. Uh, please do not confuse it with the real Delft ware. Uh, I think later on we can touch on that. Uh, local availability of raw material, that means the clay, the uh, uh, coal, and the lead helps to establish the North Stafford, Staffordshire region as the Staffordshire Pottery District. It's sitting in the west side of the Midland of, uh, in England. And the appearance of British pottery began to change following influx of Dutch and German artisans fleeing religious persecution. And that's after the uh, Reformation War. Okay, next please. 17th century city of Stoke-on-Trent. Stoke-on-Trent was sitting in the uh, Staffordshire Pottery District and combined six uh, neighboring villages into one city. And that city become, uh, became the center of British pottery industry. And pottery makers still active in the 19th century were these big name uh, pottery manufacturers. Spol and uh, Wedgwood, they last for about 250 years. Okay, next please. Uh, in those days, early days of the uh, 17th century, they were making stoneware, it uh, wasn't porcelain. Uh, the stoneware was um, non-porous, uh, non 
as compared to the previous uh, pot, uh, clay where, uh, earthenware. And so the non-porous character became a very favorite, became a big sale for the alcohol beverage export drinkers. And in it's this 18th century arrived potteries in various colors, forms, shapes were produced and the potters started playing with the material. Uh, so Toby Jugs became an English icon. I'll show you the, what Toby Jugs looks like. Next, please. Yeah, it's kind of humorous. I'm sure many of you have seen it in the antique store. Okay, next, please. Uh, at that time, the British production of uh, pottery uh, was uh, increased tremendously and became the, they uh, brought the Britain, British products to the forefront of the ceramic industry. And also because the uh, Chinese imports the tea drinking of tea, tea drinking became fashionable in the 18th century England. Porcelain tea sets were status symbols for the high society. And Josiah Wedgwood became man of the time. Okay, next please. And this is uh, Josiah Wedgwood, and he is called father of the English potter. Next, please. He was born in the sixth generation of potters at Burslem. Burslem is one of the township get mm -hmm. uh, incorporated into Stoke on Trent. Mm -hmm. And the age of nine, he lost his father and quit school, never went back to school, but then he learned more pot doing the pottery uh, with his brother at the uh, family shop called Churchyard Works. And this was founded by his great grandfather. Okay, next please. This is the picture of the Churchyard Works. You can see the church in the back and the uh, kiln, the uh, bottle shape uh, firing kiln is in the forefront. And that's how what the uh, English village looks like in those days. Next, please. And when he was 12 years old, he was inflicted with a serious case of smallpox, but he survived. Nevertheless, uh, the injury left his uh, right knee permanently damaged. Uh, at the age of uh, 24, he worked for his brother for um, 12 years and went on working with another potter for a couple of years. He couldn't stand working under someone else and uh, doing the mundane work. So he uh, worked for Thomas Wilton and that Thomas Wilton is a very famous uh, potter, especially uh, famous for his glazing technique. The two of them, got along well because both of them love to experiment with their work. Next, please. And this is example of Thomas Wilton uh, Wedgwood's product when he was working under Thomas Wilton. And this style was dis distinctly Baroque and Rococo, very uh, ornate. And the uh, green glaze in those days were blotchy, but for Joshua, uh, for Josea and uh, Wilton come up with such a smooth, even green color that was, that was considered to be a big accomplishment. Okay, next please. And age 29, he became a master potter, opened his own factory at the Ivy House Works. The, the year was uh, 1759. That's an important year for uh, Josea because he became his own boss. Next, please. This is what Ivy House looks like. It's not very big, just two uh, bottle can 
Okay, mm-hmm. go ahead. Next. And in the next three years, business expanded tremendously. So he had to move his uh, manufacture facility to another place. And this place he rent from his uh, second cousin for an annual rent of 21 pounds. This second cousin was important and I'll tell you why later. Okay, next please. Um, 1759, uh, during his uh, travel to Liverpool, he had to carry his goods on horseback and travel to Liverpool to sell. He fell off from the horse and injured his uh, uh, leg that was, uh, uh, the injury was still after effect of his smallpox. And he met a gentleman merchant. Why gentleman merchant? And because uh, Thomas Bentley traveled widely in this into Renaissance cultural, uh, it's very uh, much a learned person and uh, has good connection in the high societies of London in those days. And they became very good friends. Okay, next please. In age 34, uh, Josiah married Sarah Wedgwood. Sarah, Wed- Sarah Wedgwood was the daughter of that uh, second cousin that owned that brick house. So that's the connection. And Sarah was a, not only brought uh, a big dowry, she was also a good help in designing, in feeding back uh, what, how the products feel like, you know, as far as function is concerned. Next, please. And this is their family portrait. Uh, and they have uh, six children, three boys and three girls. Pardon me? Excuse me, please yeah. turn off your microphone. The only person's microphone is on should be Nancy. Excuse me, I hear noises that is disturbing interrupting Nancy's talk. Please be kind enough to turn off all microphones. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lily. And the, the thing I want to point out is the uh, their eldest daughter later on became the mother of the Charles Darwin. Excuse me, I think I know where the noise come from. Hang on a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, next, please. In 1795, Josea set up a branch shop in London, and the first order came from Queen Charlotte. Queen Charlotte was the grandmother to Queen Victoria, and uh, Josea received Queen Charlotte's uh, order one after another, so was a good customer, and he requested that uh, the cream-colored ware be named the Queen's ware. So I'll show you what Queen's wear look like. Next, please. And it's very simple and elegant. And this uh, type of uh, dinner plates, dinnerware, is still used to this day. Okay, next, please. 1766, uh, Josea and the Bentley officially form a partnership. Josea was into manufacturing and the Bentley was into sales and their London uh, sales office had a big showroom and that showroom became the focus or became the gathering ground for the high society people and business took off in a big way. In 1768, he lost his right legs. And some people believe that is a blessing in disguise 
because uh, he started thinking about improving the manufacturing uh, method uh, using more mechanical means. And next, please. Uh, okay. In at 10 years after he started this company, his business was doing so well, and he's a visionary. Uh, he established this uh, industrial complex called Etruria. Uh, it's also in the uh, Staffordshire Pottery District, but uh, uh, the, the campus is a 350 acres, house the manufacturing facility, house his own house and his uh, employees, uh, dormitories, it's just like uh, today's uh, uh, Apple or the big complex, okay. And Josea and Bentley started working on the Jasper where they're not just satisfied with uh, a queens where they start experimenting, venture into a new style of products. Next, please. And this is uh, to celebrate, commemorate the, the operation of uh, Etruria. And you can see the style departs vastly from the Chinese influenced blue white wear and goes into neoclassic the Greek and the Roman style, and with the sculpture, sculpturing motif on the side. Okay, and next I think it's a slideshow and showing you how the manufacturing process goes. Okay, go ahead.
Okay, Mutin, can we cut it out now? <laughs> anyway, uh, this uh, shows the important thing I like to show you is, uh, I want to show you is his uh, transfer, pattern transfer technique and the uh, making of Jasperware. So it went a little over time. Uh, anyway, Josea is a very accomplished scientist, uh, not considering not finishing school. Uh, he received the fellow of the Royal Society Award because his research in the glazing chemistry. Uh, that's quite an achievement. Okay, and the other achievements, next slide please that he has is uh, uh, glazing I just talked about, and he also changed his style, uh, totally veer from the uh, traditional style into his own. He elevated the craftsman uh, into the status of an artwork. And uh, he was so, his products were so popular, 1773, uh, Catherine the Great ordered a Russian a Russian service set for 50 people. Every piece was custom made uh, with a British scene on the, to decorate the plate. Next, please. That's just one example. Okay, next, please. Uh, he's the pioneer in industrial revolution. Um, so he's also, in the terms of advertising and the marketing sales, he's a, he introduced a lot of new concept, uh, established a showroom and the traveling salesman and the buy now and pay later, also money back guarantee. All this was his uh, brainchild. Okay, next, please. Uh, visionary, explore. He uh, construct the complex, the manufacturing complex, and he also uh, lobbied the government and construct the river canal passing by his campus, connecting the neighboring rivers together so he can transport his goods from uh, his uh, com uh, facility all the way to Liverpool and uh, export on ships go everywhere in the world. Next, please. Next, please. And uh, there is a historical marker in North Carolina indicating that he uh, tried to purchase uh, cowling clay from American Indians. Okay. Next, please. And the, more than just a manufacturer, he's also a humanitarian. He's named a radical poet. Uh, Potter, because anytime there is a revolution against the uh, totalitarian society uh, dictatorship, he's all for it. And for America Revolution, 1778, he uh, made two medallions to honor Washington and Franklin. Okay, next, please. You know, Washington to the left, Franklin to the right. Next, please. And also he's strongly against slavery. Uh, he designed the medallion with the famous inscription, am I not a man and a brother? And the, the, later on this medallion became official medallion adopted by the Slave Emancipation Society. Next, please. And this is the sample and this medallion is used as earrings, a pendant you know, for decorative items. Next, please. And this is a collection of this Jasper Ware, very distinct. No, no there's a, nothing like it elsewhere in the world. Okay, next, please. Uh, there is a lesson to be learned in the history, it has something a little bit to do with it. Uh, Josea Wedgwood, 1793 McCartney mission uh, was sent by King George. King George III to China with the intention to establish embassy in Beijing to open up new ports for British trade. And Wedgwood pottery 
was one item included in the presents from okay. King George the third. Okay, next. However, the mission was a complete fa failure. Uh, all the British requests were rejected by Emperor Qianlong. Qianlong declared, I set no value on objects strange or ingenious and I have no use for your country's manufacturers. And so much for goodwill gesture extended from the England. And this encounter resulted in a dark, dark chapter of Chinese history, started the Opium War and the uh, eight country invasion of China that lasted until for 200 years. And so there is a lesson to be learned that one shouldn't be so arrogant, even though you had all the wealth in the world, then things change. Okay, next please. I'll show you a couple of uh, English wear, and that uh, is influenced by the blue, white, Chinese porcelain. This is manufactured by Mington, the garden, famous garden, Ming garden pattern. Next please. Royal Dalton also used the same pattern, a similar pattern and more elaborate, it's just beautiful. And you can still see them on the market these days. Okay, next please. China glaze, a little bit uh, influenced China, Chinese porcelain head on Wedgwood was that uh, uh, the, uh, as the uh, cream, uh, cream wear, Queens were fall out of uh, popularity. They have to come, they had to come up with a new product, and they use a white glaze called China glaze. Uh, the the uh, invention of the China glaze was attributed to Wedgwood, and later this uh, white glaze was applied to cover the whole thing, and then uh, they Wedgwood. People either paint the blue thing or print the blue thing. I'll show you two examples next. And you can see it's, uh, there's something lacking there. But uh, anyway, uh, I still think Wedgwood is great. And uh, I hope you agree with me. And so this is the, the end of my talk. Thank you very much.